Hey everyone, it's Eugene here and welcome to Forensics Talks. This is episode 84 and my guest today is William Messerschmidt. Now today, just before I get started, just a few words. Uh, as usual, uh, we are broadcasting live and we have a comment section. So if you are listening right now, I always like to know where people are listening from. So go ahead and type in the, the city or the country uh, that you're watching this from. And uh, yeah, always good to know where people are there. Uh, also, if you have any questions or comments during the talk, please put them into the comments. Uh, I do look over every now and then, and uh, every so often I will pose a question from the, uh, the people who are watching here to the guest. Um, just a couple of announcements, uh, some quick ones. So the first one is that um, we have a uh, forensic, uh, excuse me, we have a Recon 3D class that's coming up on June 6th. And let me just add that here. And so the Recon 3D class, for those of you that don't know, it's an iPhone scanning app. And uh, we do a training course that goes along with that. And so we basically cover some of the best practices and how you can get really good data. Uh, it is relatively easy to use, but there is some technique required in order for you to really get the uh, best data and the best accuracy possible. So that's going to be on June 6th. And this runs from about um, 1 p.m. to about 5 p.m. There's an assignment. It's ACTAR. You get ACTAR CEUs if you like. And uh, that is going to be followed up uh, with a cloud, a, a cloud compare course. So for those of you that are fairly new to uh, 3D scanning and you know you don't have maybe a lot of background, a cloud compare is a fantastic program. It's free. It's open source. And it allows you to do a ton of different things with the data. And the, the data that comes out of Recon 3D uh, we'll go right into Cloud Compare. So Cloud Compare is a complementary course uh, for, uh, you know, for a Recon 3D or if you're using that kind of app. Okay, that's all I have to say today. Oh, except for one more thing, actually, yeah. And that is that don't forget that these uh, interviews are uh, podcasts as well. So if you are using... Uh, Apple Podcasts or Google, Spotify, whatever, you can find them on there. So um, I usually don't ask people to subscribe and all that stuff, but the podcasts are really efficient and they're great because you can listen to them while you're driving or working. So if you can, go search it out. Make sure that you subscribe on there. And, uh, you know, hopefully you can listen if you're not catching this live on YouTube or on another platform. Okay. Let me bring up my notes here and we are going to get started. So um, my next guest is William Messerschmidt. And I met him just a few weeks ago at the Rex conference in Orlando. And uh, we were just talking before, but before I say anything else, I do want to congratulate all the people who helped to organize the event. It was a great conference. The, the crash day on the Tuesday was fantastic. I mean, there's nowhere else I've ever been. Well, I were, you know, you could turn your head and see, you know, one crash going on and then, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, another one and then another one. Um, it was really overwhelming, but the, uh, the organizers did an absolutely uh, fantastic job. Everybody worked hard that week and there was a lot of, uh, commitment to making the event a success. So, hey, congratulations, everybody. I certainly enjoyed it. And I managed to catch um, William's presentation. And so it was on dashboard cameras and human vision. And so um, William Messerschmidt is a former police officer and traffic homicide investigator. And after ser serving with the city of Auburn with distinction for eight years, um, William left the government service to work with the late Dr. Edward L. Robinson, where his work was focused on the investigation and analysis of commercial and heavy vehicle crashes. Now, while working alongside physicists and engineers at Robinson and Associates, um, Bill was introduced to Dr. Jeffrey Mut Mutart, and almost immediately he went back to school for the study of human factors, psychology, and engineering. I will point out that we did an episode with uh, uh, Jeffrey Mutart, so you can catch that uh, if you look back into uh, YouTube, just do a search and you'll see it. So since that time, uh, Bill studied human factors, and he's uh, focusing on transportation and industrial safety at the University of Idaho, uh, Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University, and the University of Aberdeen. Uh, in 2022, Integra Forensics was founded when Messerschmitt Safety Consultants welcomed Miss Olivia Normand as a new partner. 
Now, Williams' accident reconstruction work is primarily focused on applying uh, human factor science to the analysis of traffic crashes and industrial accidents. But as a company, Integra Forensics provides services related to uh, accident reconstruction, human factors analysis, forensic video and audio analysis and regulatory compliance. Today, what we're going to be talking about is vision and perception and how that is important, whether it's for traffic accidents, whether it's for, um, you know, police shooting cases for industrial type of accidents and things like that. Um, I think it has a lot of merit in many, many different areas and not just limited to, you know, traffic accidents. So let me bring him in here. There he is. Hey, Will, how are you doing? Hey, doing well, Eugene. Thanks for having me on. And and let me just first echo what you said about how great and how well organized the Rex conference was and, and my gratitude to those uh, organizers and volunteers as well. Yeah, it was a it was just a fantastic week. I I was uh, really I mean, like most people I saw, everybody was saying the same thing. Like we're here for a week and we're busy. Like everyone's talking and with that many people together, you know, it was just actually well. One thing it was nice to meet a lot of the names that you know that you've known uh, from before and just you haven't you know met met face to face before. So that was kind of cool. But yeah, I I, I really enjoyed it. So um and i'm glad that i caught your presentation which uh i have to say to you uh you know thanks for uh i just kind of stopped you and said hey man like uh this is what i do i have this uh forensics talks thing like would you be willing to you know jump on in and uh you said yeah sure so i was like cool uh so thanks thanks for being here yeah absolutely yeah i i knew who you were so you were one of those people i got to meet and uh appreciate you having me on gene oh right on um i want to ask you a little bit regarding your background. So, I mean, you were, uh, in, in, you know, with working with the police, um, what, was that something that you had, uh, in your mind from the beginning, like you want to be a police officer or like what, 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 how did, what was your path there? Well, so not really. Um, I guess I probably left for university with, with one, there was one thing I was definite about, and that was, I didn't want an indoor job under fluorescent lights. Um, I think my first declared major was something in agriculture or forestry. Uh, so ultimately though, I, I studied economics and, uh, really enjoyed that field for a lot of the same reasons that I enjoy, uh, human factors. Uh, by the time I'm getting ready to graduate, uh, and I've been working my way through school, I realized that the career progression for economics is exactly what I didn't want. It's indoors under fluorescent lights and the opportunity to uh, serve as a police officer was there. Uh, lots of my family have uh, served in the United States Army. Uh, so a little bit of similar background there, uh, fathers, uncles, great grandfathers. Um, and so I just, I went ahead and dove into uh, law enforcement. Oh, nice. And um, while you were with uh, law enforcement, I mean, you were doing um, traffic accidents and things like that. Um, how, I mean, we're going to be talking about human factors today, but how much of human factors made up what you were doing with the police? Uh, very little. Um, you know, at, at that time, you know, this is mid nineties at that, at that time, th there, there, there hadn't been much crossover between human factors, science, engineering, psychology, and traffic crash reconstruction. And it's really uh, Dr. Mutard, uh, along with uh, Dr. Olson before him, that created that bridge between existing research that's going on in the human factors world at places like University of Michigan, and all of us on the crash side that were just blissfully unaware that anything was even being done. Um, and it's not till Olson publishes this paper and kind of cross publishes between HFES, Human Factors and Ergonomic Society, and the Society of Automotive Engineers in 1984 and 1986, that really the kind of the, the world in crash reconstruction world in general sort of wakes up to it. And then that's the only thing. And it gets used and abused. And Dr. Mutart has lectured, spoke, taught, written, um, Olson himself did, you know, he, Hey, this wasn't, this was one test, not a universal constant like gravity. Uh, and so then, then Jeff, Dr. Mutart kind of, I think completed that bridge building that Paul Olson had started. Yeah. So I have to ask you what, what made you leave the police? I mean, a lot of people that get into policing don't leave, <laughs> they, they, they stick it out. So yeah. It was, it was a, it was a really tough call for me. I loved it, but I, Honestly, um, 
I was at home on one of my rare off days and the phone rang and it was Dr. Robinson. And I'm this blue stripe uniform patrolman. 5% of my job is still to write parking tickets. And here's this guy who'd worked for Ford or the Pinto crashes and written SAE papers on the phone asking me if I want a part-time job. And there was, you know, there's no way I'm going to say no to that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, about a year later, um, he needed full-time work. My ex-wife had finished graduate school at Auburn and was had been offered a teaching job in at one of the universities in Birmingham. So it just, it, it made sense. And it was one of those, um, yeah, I hate to quote my least favorite footballer of all time, but, you know, a little bit of the hand of Maradona and a little bit of the hand of God, you know, although I think there's a little bit more Maradona's hand um, and maybe in my case, a little more of the hand of God. But uh, it was it was just one of these times where you got to make a decision. And I, I took the risk and I'm here with you today. Yeah, cool. And then so you were working privately uh, for how many years before you sort of went out on your own? Um, well, you know, as, as luck would have it, as wonderful as it was to work with Dr. Ed, he was already retired from Birmingham, University of Alabama at Birmingham and retired from Samford University as professor of physics. And within a couple of years of me getting there, he's retiring, retiring. And I just, you know, business sales and transitions, you know, going back to that econ background I had, I had no confidence that I'd be the guy that got to hang around and uh, sort of jumped to another company that didn't work out. Uh, and as a stopgap, I said, well, I got a couple clients. I can probably get the mortgage paid for six months till we find a new place to live and get my daughter in a new school. And, you know, 16 years later, uh, I got uh, partners and employees and, and it's gone, gone pretty well. Right. Right. Well, let me ask you about the uh, the whole human factors thing. And, you know, like you just mentioned, like in the 90s or, or you know, with policing, it wasn't something that was really taken uh, into large consideration. And so in your mind, is the, have you seen a transition or was there a point where you can say, yeah, you know, during these few years, people started to really switch their thinking and, you know, the paradigm shifted a little bit into more of human factors. Like, what is that like for you? Uh, so I would really, that, that, if I could attribute it to one specific thing, it would be Dr. Mutart's uh, 2003 SAE paper, the, the um, uh, analysis of perception response time uh, quantification based on meta analysis. And there's probably two years, uh, 03 to 05, where, uh, as we typically are as human beings, we're quite resistant to change. But as the truth um, that different stimulus equals different response starts to win out, that's that's where I think the focus shifted. So maybe maybe 05 and, and moving forward. It, it's more widely acknowledged, uh, even for people who maybe did disagreed with some aspect of Jeff Newsart's research. Uh, that okay, well, he's he's got a point, um, which at least I, I believe he certainly does have a, some very very good points. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's a complex subject, and there's been I know there's been like a little bit of I don't say controversy, but there, there's like things about, and I want to ask you about this too about you know 1.5 seconds and like sort of people. Uh, pinning things down or trying to paint everything with a very, you know, with one brush and calling it what it is. But there's a very complex set of considerations you have to take when we talk about human factors and how people, how we see, how we, you know, how our brains work, how we react, the, the external conditions and things like that. So, I mean, what, what did you see as some of the early problems with um, the way people were treating like the whole human factor science? Well, then, I think the first I, I really became aware of how uh, how broad the scope of the problems in our industry was when I started graduate school at University of Idaho through their engineering outreach. And I went to my advisor, uh, the late Dr. Brian Dyer, and said, I'd like to do my project uh, this term on polls and forensic aspects of, of, of uh, driver response. And Dr. Dyer uh, looks at the book and he says, wow, that's the, getting into this is like a capstone project. You need to finish, uh, you know, advanced human factors and human factors engineering applications and human computer interaction before you even start reading this. 
And I thought, wow, you know, I've had engineering psychology and research methods and cognitive science, perception and sensation. And he doesn't think I'm ready for this. You know, and I, and, you know, I mean, it was an A student too. Like, this is the intro that a lot of people are getting. They missed all that stuff about learning and behavior, visual perception, because at the end of the day, human factors is it's so much, such a broader field, such a bigger field than just PRT. Um, you know, it's the Greek word ergonomics is the science of work. Uh, and it's been a little bit more uh, you know, broadly defined than that as the way human beings interact with the human made environment. And th there's a whole lot more interactions and influences on our interaction from the environment than just that emergency PRT when someone blows a stop sign in front of us. Mm -hmm. And so just kind of stepping back um, from Jeff's, uh, Jeff's research and saying, wow, human factors applications to traffic safety and crash reconstruction are like much, much, much broader than this. And we've, we've got to start learning more about them and trying to apply the, these principles methodologically and scientifically. Um, how do you break apart like the, because it's so broad, like I'll, I'll take a stab at it and I'll, I'm going to miss something probably. But for example, for me, I see that there's like external factors, the extrinsic factors, which the environment, the weather, like all those other things, which cause difficulty with the way we can perceive or interpret or whatever. And then there's sort of like the mechanics of the, like our eyes and the, the, the biological function of how we see. And then there, I would say even there's there's the the software part of the brain and, and the processing and stuff and kind of what goes on in your head. Um, and then there's sort of another aspect that I see, which is all the research and the validation that goes into putting people in different scenarios and looking to see, you know, you know how average and 95th percentile, how people perform under certain conditions. But um, and that may be a rather crude uh, breakout of certain things. But I just I'm curious, how do you how do you keep it organized in your head? Um, you're not far off. I, I think what I would change is that that uh, the picture's a good bit bigger, potentially, and broader even than that. If you look at the, the books that uh, James Reason, Sidney Decker, Jens Rasmussen uh, have written about human factors and in accident investigation, uh, you know, they'll start with the, the human right here, and they'll extend out to, you know, to the workplace environment, to the social cultural environment. You can broaden that spectrum all, you know, just about without it, without a limit. Um, but, but yeah, at the, at the level of the human, it, it is, I would add to what you said, your learned experience, uh, the, the learning and behavior side of it, conditioned and, and unconditioned learned responses are conditioned and learn responses, um, you have that. And then you have, you know, the context in which the operator is, is doing things, including, like you said, weather, roadway environment, signage, uh, and, and then, you know, sort of the bigger picture beyond that, you have employees who are specifically incentivized to work harder, longer hours and push themselves beyond a safe limit. Uh, that that is part of the environment too. Uh, it doesn't come into litigation for crash reconstructionists as much, but it's a it's a big picture view working your way down to these uh, smallest aspects like how how much reflected light, how much luminance do you need to excite the photoreceptors, and then your brain to interpret that correctly as contrast with the background and then to understand that contrast with the background again kind of now you're maybe leaning a little bit on learned experience that's a pedestrian mm -hmm. or, or that's a dog running out in front of me yeah that's a that's an interesting point so the the things which affect people's ability to see well obviously one has to be lighting um you know how dark or how bright um the environment is obviously in, in very dark conditions or foggy or weather um, that has to be a, a factor. Um, but, you know, you mentioned contrast, right? So that's something else that can affect how well we see. Um, what other things are there that can cause problems with, you know, the actual ability to see things? 
So well, anything that, that reduces contrast, either color contrast or under low light conditions that we're usually concerned with in, in crash and industry, uh, brightness contrast. So anything that, that blurs those lines, uh, but then other things that help us detect the presence of an object or size and motion, those are, those are two big ones. Okay. Uh, and the, the, you know, so so if you're developing a model for uh, you know visibility or recognition, those are two factors that you would, you have to at least consider. Let me ask you about how people see because during your presentation, this is one of the things that I actually found pretty interesting, which was you know the fact that well part of your presentation was comparing you know video or a camera and then to how people actually see, which is not the same. And one of your points was there's, you can't reproduce it. You can't say that this is exactly what somebody saw or the way that they saw it. So can you explain um, a little bit about human vision and like what areas we focus on, what we detect in terms of like motion and field of view, all that sort of thing. Like if you had to summarize that, how uh, can could you do, take a stab at it? Sure. Well, if we start out with the, the very central part of our vision, uh, the closer in to right in front of you you are, your your vision had that's where your best color vision, your best detail vision, yeah, anything you ever had to do with something really small, you got it right in front of you, you know, directly in line with your eyes. So that's where your your foveal vision is, uh, the central vision, and then as we go out from there, that we lose the clarity. Uh, we lose the clarity pretty quickly by you know, different people have different numbers, but uh, you know, one to five degrees is the clearest, and then we're out to ten, and you know, maybe a normal gaze is is twenty or thirty degrees, depending on on what type of research you're looking at. Um, and, and then, but as we go out, and our vision is less detail rich and less. Uh, we're less capable of seeing color, we become more and more dependent on the rods, which the, the rods in our eyes as opposed to the cones. Cones are all stacked up in the middle, giving us that color and detail vision. Rods are the rest of our eyes going back. They're giving us monochromatic light sensitivity, and they're also giving us motion sensitivity. Uh, so although the image is getting blurrier, we're getting a relative advantage in terms of, of motion and brightness. So when you talk about motion, though, motion is something that is typically wider. We have our so the 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 most sensitive motion receptors are the are the the rods, and and they're just off they're offset just a few degrees. They begin and get heavier, you know, in, in the periphery. So by the time you look like pure peripheral vision is just rods, detecting motion, you know right out here not very difficult you can detect this motion but you can't you can't see it clearly right you can't tell what the heck it is but you know you know something is moving and that that sounds like some some kind of a like a natural adaptation of humans over you know hundreds of thousands of years probably for 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 good measure or whatever yeah if you want to know something's coming at you if you want to know um you know prey animals have like like horses their eyes are on the sides of their head uh they have the ultimate you know, peripheral vision. Uh, and then you look at, at predatory animals, you know, wolves, dogs, cats, their eyes are like ours. They're in the, they're, you know, in, in the front you know, to see what they're going after. And then, so let's talk about, okay, so we're, we're looking, we do the certain areas that we see or whatever. And then obviously they get into the eyes, they're, they're, they're converted so that our brains can understand what happens internally, you know, when let's say, for example, let's say a person actually sees something, whether it's a, a cat, dog, an animal that's, you know, all of a sudden pops out on the roadway. What is, what process is going on sort of biologically in the brain and then back to the body um, in order to, you know, avoid a mishap? Well, so we're, 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 we pick up on some cue, whether it's the, whether it's the motion or, or the color contrast, or, or just, you know, we see the object, we're fortunate and we see it right there in our, our uh, clearest vision. We know what it is. We know that it's moving. We have the situation awareness to sort of project the outcome as being something bad if I don't change my my trajectory. Uh, 
what we've got to do is is fixate on that, identify it, um, and that's going to take you know this combination of the rods and cones. Uh, so we're going to have to we're going to have to look at it, and then because our central vision is so small, we're often going to need to make more than one fixation. And those that those saccadic fixations are happening three to four times a second, and to some extent they're going to be uh, the pattern of them. Although it's happening subconsciously, uh, is a learned behavior in and of itself. Uh, so uh, another paper by Dr. Mutart, he looked at inexperienced drivers versus experienced drivers, and their visual search patterns were different. They weren't thinking about it consciously and controlling the movements of their eyes with conscious thought, but the experienced drivers were looking more efficiently farther ahead where novice drivers were looking right in, in front of them. Uh, if you've sat and watched uh, you know, a sporting match with someone who really knows it or played it, and you notice that they're looking at different things than you are, uh, you know, you you didn't see the foul and don't even know what happened. And they know, oh, you know, oh, you know, that was a cleat up tackle from behind or that was a holding on the offensive lineman. Like, how did they see that? Well, it's because their visual search pattern is trained to go to those specific places uh, because of their experience, just like the experienced drivers. So now we hope that we have some experience that's beneficial to us you know, as the you know, machine operator, industrial worker, driver, same thing's gonna to apply to pilots or, or train operators, anyone else, uh, so that we efficiently determine what this object is and what the pattern uh, it you know, should mean. And, and that's only gonna give us, you'd see only about 20% of what we quote unquote see is coming from our eyes. The other 80% is occurring in our brain. Wow, so it's like being filled in for, uh... Yeah, for the for the for the context of everything else, right? Because we I mean, we can't possibly search the entire theoretical field of view that we have uh, with these saccadic movements. Uh, so our brain is literally filling in gaps with what it thinks it's there and what was there last time. Uh, you know, probably probably more than just me has put their cell phone down somewhere and gone looking for it and and looked exactly where like looked on top of the coffee table where the phone was not seen it and then gone tear, torn the bedroom apart come back out and found <laughs> the cell phone right there where you just looked for it it's because you you didn't get your central vision on it and your brain filled in the blank coffee table that it thought was there oh man i never done that before huh yeah okay uh we'll skip through that one um let me show something uh, this is uh something you did at your at your presentation and uh, I thought it was kind of cool. And I'm just press play here, but it, it's you kind of explain how we see. And so I don't know if you can just describe, uh, you know, this this particular video that you put together. So what we did was we we took a, a photo that we purchased from iStock, and our forensic animator and I sat down. We we based the the visual. We based the clear area on a paper research that was done by some uh, scientists at the University of Liverpool who are trying to develop uh, augmented reality or au augmented vision techniques for people with particularly glaucoma, where their, their peripheral vision is degrading seriously. And I'm trying to show how do those saccades start to fill in the picture. Uh, and Greg and I kind of came up with sort of a generic, where would you look? Well, if you lifted your head up and opened your eyes and you saw this human form in the middle of you, um, people are drawn to people's faces from the time we're very young. So you'd probably look to the goalkeeper's face and we're drawn to motion. So you'd probably look for the ball. Um, and then you'd start filling in, you, you seen edges of the, of the, uh, of the soccer goal and you start to follow straight lines and edges so that your brain can hopefully fill out this picture. Uh, so this is just idealized. And, you know, for example, if you know, my son's a, a high school goalkeeper, if his goalkeeping coach, if we put eye tracking on him and he watched this, he'd probably be looking at very different things than a soccer fan. Um, he'd be looking at hip position and hand position and thumb position and all these details. And the rest of us are just trying to see if the ball's going to go in the net or if it's going to go over the post. 
it's, it, you bring up an interesting point though, because you said, you know, like we go to faces and things like that first. So, you know, if you're driving down the road and there's a pedestrian that comes in, or let's say you're an officer and, you know, you're, you're in a, a difficult situation or something, and then, you know, somebody pops out from around the corner, um, your eyes are drawn to that person or, or human uh, immediately. Um, but what about when it's something you're not expecting or something that is is difficult to interpret, I can I can see that causing all kinds of issues with trying to figure out what the heck is that, you know? Right. No, it really is. And that's where experience and training come in for, you know, for police, uh, you know, for, for military units that need to do, you know, close quarters work. Uh, you have to look at hands and you have to look at hips and, and you know, the facial expression of someone is much less important to an officer in a potentially critical incident than what is in the suspect's hand. And you have to train yourself to, to you know, through practice and experience and, and you know, uh, you know, some of the better training, the virtual reality the, 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 that's being used to get people to look at the important stuff. Okay. I, w I was going to ask you about this anyway, but uh, Stanley here uh, from South Africa has uh, has asked this, so I'm going to bring it up here. Um, he asks, what is your response to anyone making a claim, typically in court, that the internationally accepted uh, perception reaction time for a driver is 2.5 seconds or 1.5 seconds, etc.? cetera? Um, well, I guess, so the first thing I would say is a accepted by who? Um, which I think is is Jeff Mutart's response as well. But what I what I like to do, and I do this in the courses that I teach, uh, is just break it down for people. Uh, you're driving home on the freeway tonight, uh, and you're in that sort of pre rush hour traffic where traffic's zipping along close to the speed limit. But if you tried to leave a legal following distance between yourself and the vehicle in front of you, three cars would jam their way in. Uh, if the brake lights on the lead vehicle come on and it takes you a second and a half to put your foot on your brake, you've already hit them. Uh, clearly, there are response times that are much faster than a second and a half. Um, you know, and imagine whatever ridiculously complicated scenario you want to a tree falls in front of you you know when wind blows over a billboard or a, a deer becomes apparent on the side of the road really you can do that in one and a half seconds um you, you know you should you know playing football in the english premier league or uh you know flying fighter planes for your military if, if you're that fast under those really vague uh, difficult to to comprehend scenarios that are very unlikely to happen. Um, and if you can get people to think about the fact that with every other stimulus, sound, light, instructions, different stimulus, different response, uh, there's a reason fire alarms are loud because you need to reach a certain level to alert people and to really let them know this is bad. Mm -hmm. Go, please leave the building now. You you could never have, you know, just a quiet. Hey, Eugene, there's there's there might be a fire in your office. <laughs> like, no, no, Nest would never do that. They start giving you, you know, something with verbal commands, very definite, loud, and then it's supplemented by these super annoying, very loud, high decibel pressure beeps. Uh, so, like, it, what else in your life do all the different stimuli? create the exact same response in the same amount of time. Nothing. You can't name anything. Um, and if, if you can just break people away from that and say, well, we just need to look at different scenarios and look at what affects response time, then people, I think, have an easier time grasping this and, and are, and the, I think the biggest resistance that I saw this with Jeff, uh, you know, really early on, um, before he was Dr. Mitart, if you could make people understand the potential simplicity of this analysis, that you can break these down into three or four types of crashes and four or five important variables. Um, and if you just look at those, you're going to get pretty close. You're going to get a pretty good distribution. There's, there may be times and reasons why you need to look deeper and uh, you need more 
expertise to get to a to a tighter level even than that but it really isn't that difficult i think people saw those regression equations and they were just so blown away that they there's an infinite number of possibilities of different crashes and different lighting levels and and they get overwhelmed and then they just go not small point five it's just that that's that's where we stop because otherwise i you know it's nothing i can figure out yeah, I mean, you you had a video that I watched um, where it's a deer that comes out on the roadway, and watching the video, it's it's surprising how quickly this thing just comes into view. And so, and I've I've had a similar experience, not with a deer, but with a with a a, a rabbit. And so, it was driving late at night or whatever, and I mean, this thing popped out, and I, it, there was no time, there was just no way to react. In fact, I did absolutely nothing. I didn't swerve. I didn't move. I didn't break. I didn't, you know, I couldn't do anything. So, if you have a you have a scenario, you have an accident, you have a collision, you have something like that. What I mean, people are doing research, obviously, to determine a lot of these factors and a lot of these variables. How does somebody like yourself take a scenario where you've got an accident and then apply the research or the the analysis properly to that specific case? Um, so that that can be that can be challenging sometimes uh, when we do research. Uh, it's it's pretty sterile. Uh, Olson talks about this in, in, in his book. There's a concept in, in uh, really a lot of the social sciences of ec ecological validity. We want to make our research match the real world, um, but but we can't. We're in a driving simulator, and we've got you know undergraduate students who are getting extra credit for this. Not you know moms who are working and coming home and taking their kids to soccer practice and, you know, truck drivers who've been on the road for six hours, you know, like real people working in the real economy. Um, so the, one of the first steps is to stay away as, as Olson, as Mutar, pretty much everyone is recommended from applying the average as the bellwether standard for human performance because there's good reason to think that the average, if we're, when we're talking about tenths of a second, when we're talking about 1.1 versus 1.3 or 1.4, the average may not be the best, uh, the gold standard to, to compare every driver to, because that driver has a more complex task in the real world than in almost certainly our, our research subject did. Uh, the second thing is to make sure that the research that you're working with um, matches the scenario as closely as possible. And this is super easy in some cases. It kind of like a, an accident reconstruction analogy would be a crush energy calculation. Occasionally, someone does hit a concrete bridge abutment head on, and man, it is exactly what they did in the NHTSA test. And you know, there's a, there's a yeah. very good, very strong correlation between A and B stiffness coefficients uh, derived from the NHTSA test to your crash. But most of the time, there's other factors involved. So once we find the most applicable research, we, we often need to look at a lot of the other environmental factors that came up in the normal naturalistic world and see what kind of cumulative effect they have. You know, lots of these things that we have to deal with as forensic scientists, if a researcher allowed them to slip into his or her research, they'd be considered procedural confounding variables and the research could kick back in peer review. We're stuck dealing with them. So we need to judge the research based on the totality of these circumstances and then maybe look for how those variables themselves, when they were tested in a, in a sterile environment, change driver performance and, and just make sure we don't miss the forest for the trees. Well, like I have zeroed down the primary aspect of this accident or traffic crash to this specific uh, gap acceptance looming effects, uh, you know, contrast sensitive, contrast, you know, low contrast recognition threshold. And that's it. That's the only paper I'm looking at. And then there's all these external factors that you didn't, that you didn't consider. And the balance of balancing effect of all of them 
may overwhelm or may materially change the distribution of that primary effect. So uh, there's a, there can be more to it, uh, just like crush. Uh, there can be more to it than, than you can just answer by looking at the five primary driving variables. Two questions I want to ask you, and I'm going to forget. So I'm going to say them both at the same time. The first one is uh, to ask you to talk a little bit about what situational awareness means in terms of human factors. And then also uh, you, you had mentioned like gap studies and some of those gap studies. And I don't know if you could just say a few words about some of that, but let, let, maybe let's start with the uh, situa situational awareness. So um, situation awareness is a, a concept that Dr. McGansley at Texas Tech uh, really codified. It's an, it's an outgrowth of uh, Christopher Wicken's multiple resource theory. And, and she developed it specifically, I think specifically for aviation is where at the time she was working. But it's, it's human performance in a dynamic or changing environment. And she goes through three stages uh, to perceive the environment, to comprehend the environment, and then to project the state of the environment. And when we can do those three things, we can, we can see it and, and understand what it is. We can comprehend the significance of it, and we can project how it's going to change relative to us. Then we can operate safely in a changing world, um, or we can operate efficiently. I mean, you, you can apply this to you know, a, a sporting competition, just like you can apply it to uh, an industrial work process, the pilots it was originally designed to evaluate, or, you know, or, or automobile drivers. Um, so it's that sort of three-stage process that, you know, is a, is a, a kind of functional refinement of multiple resource theory. Okay. So let's talk about uh, gap, uh, like gap analysis and different types of studies that are looking at uh, gap analysis. What, what can you tell me about some of what's going on today? That's, so I think what's going on today mostly is trying to get people like Mutart did with PRT, trying to get people aware that it's even out there. Uh, I, I think through most of, of the Western world, there's this fail to yield right away uh, kind, of, kind of generic understanding of fail to yield right away, that it involves you entering someone else's traffic flow and creating an immediate hazard. Well, what if the hazard's only immediate because I'm posting a video to TikTok and didn't tap my brake and slow down a few miles an hour um, or sending an email or something like that? Did, did you create an immediate hazard to me or did I create an immediate hazard to myself? Mm -hmm. um, so those are sort of two extremes there, but within those extremes, uh, highway engineers going back decades have been looking at what is the time gap? Because time turns out to be the variable that they found was statistically significant and relevant. What's the time gap that drivers need before the average driver, 50th percentile driver, will pull out and try to cross a road or make a left turn or make a right turn or a you know, left turn across oncoming traffic. And that research is there. It's there for cars. It's there for trucks. There's, there's less for heavy vehicles. Uh, it's a less robust data set, but it does exist and it's materially relevant. So if we know, suppose... Uh, my pullout is one that based on this research upon which in the US and Canada and Western Europe our highways are designed. So the validity of it sort of speaks for itself um, as our, where our whole road system is built. So I'm more aggressive than 75% of drivers, you know, passenger vehicle drivers would be. That's worth knowing. But if your perception response time is slower than 75% of, of drivers, that is also relevant information to consider uh, when you have uh, any kind of insurance or legal uh, or, or internal corporate determination of you know who who caused this accident and how how, how should we attribute you know, blame fault liability or, or or how do we identify problems so that we can better train and equip uh, our, our drivers. Vision. What what deficiencies in, in equipment or training do they have? You should know both sides, and that the information's out there 
to compare performance to performance in terms of, of accepting or rejecting a gap in traffic. When looking at the research from, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, you know, because we, I guess we're on to about 20 years, right? When Jeff first, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting on there. But how has uh, technology played a role in how we document evidence or document, you know, data and stuff like that? So how, how was it, how were the experiments uh, performed before versus what kinds of things are happening today? Well, I mean, like if you go back to studies from like the 1970s, like there's a great study on that, that's kind of integral to gap acceptance um, uh, from 1972. They're using like camcorder tripod mounted video and trying to get a film of these drivers to see when they turn their head. Uh, you know, we kind of went to digital video for some stuff, the more recent gap acceptance papers in, in that vein particularly have been um, uh, digital video. Then, you know, in the PRT stuff, you had the like the old Vericom or IST accelerometers with a you know, tape switch on the brake pedal. Uh, Mutart and I did a couple studies like that up in, in Ontario, not too far from you, uh, about probably 10 years ago. Um, now we can plug into this controller area network, uh, you know, data bus in the car, and like the stuff Virginia Tech is doing is just mind blowing. And they have so much data about everything going on uh, that the challenge for researchers is finding it. And you've got video, you've got CAN bus, live feed, brake, gas, accelerator, you know, steering wheel, steering wheel angle, now that we've got you know, drive by wire. Uh, so you get these massively robust data sets from uh, naturalistic studies because you can plug this into a, to a car that's on the road normally. And, and we have like the ultimate, I mean, as close to the ultimate ecological validity as we'll ever get in you know, naturalistic data as long as we analyze it correctly. Are there, are there, is there any tech that people use to, for example, track your your eyes or things that track you know the, your head motion or things like that i mean obviously cameras helpful to kind of see where but i'm wondering if people are actually getting like really accurate data uh from that sort of thing and and you know eye tracking i'm glad you mentioned it because that's one of the coolest the, one of the coolest pieces of technology that the, the price is coming down like if you so there, there's been eye tracking for quite some time these big goggles that look like military night vision that you strapped to your head and you, you could never do anything but drive a simulator with them. Uh, you know, it'd be dangerous to walk around the office wearing them. Um, and they do, they did very effectively track your pupil movement. At this point, uh, there's a company, I think they're, I think Neon, that's about to release or maybe just has released glasses. I mean, they just, they look like the reading glasses I'm wearing uh, and they're, uh, that, that will do eye tracking. Now that specific, those specific ones may not reach or some of them, I, I, I don't own them. I, I don't know if they reach the, like, you know, the heavy hitter government funded research institute level of the eye tracking stuff that's being used, but it, it's getting to the point where it's almost commercially available to get good data. And the the best eye tracking is prices are coming down like scanners did from hundreds of thousands to tens of thousands. And now I think this neon product is supposed to be, uh, you know, something like 6,000 euros or 5,000, 6,500 bucks US. Um, you mentioned, you know, putting these goggles on or whatever. So naturally my, my mind is wandering over to, to virtual reality and, and any applications are, are there, is, is anyone doing anything with virtual reality and looking at human perception, reaction time, stuff like that? I think that's ultimately the direction that we're going to go because, because VR, um, at least for the display of these things, uh, VR technology is growing of its own volition, of its own need. Uh, you know, the applications from entertainment to to defense are just enormous. Uh, the, the ability to train employees of any kind uh, using virtual reality is is amazing. And it's getting like, well, I, I think in some cases it is 
really dialed in to the point where it is the, the accuracy and precision are, are spot on. Um, the, the challenge is going to be uh, to get that and use that as the displays so that the, the people, whether they're clients, jurors, supervisors, safety professionals, whoever it is that needs to understand uh, a, an incident can view it in VR uh, and, and have much um, much closer to the same experience as the human operator in that environment. Yeah, and I guess the advantage there, and one of the difficulties, and you mentioned this in your presentation, was it's very difficult to, well, you can, again, you know, what you see on a computer monitor is not what you're going to be seeing, you know, at an actual scene, or even if you show somebody a video, then that's also not, you know, really what they're going to be able to see. But if you give the someone the ability to look around, inside of a VR environment, at least they have that ability to sort of focus in on different areas, turn their head. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's some really interesting, um, and, and you can do tracking too. So you can actually track, track head position and stuff like that. I don't know if you can do eye tracking in VR, but I'm sure somebody's smart enough that they could probably figure it out, combine both. I think it probably, I think, I don't know if it's been done. I, I imagine you can because eye tracking is integral. To, eye tracking research has been integral to the creation of the better VR stuff. Uh, but yeah, I mean, when you think about the fact that what's really going on when you quote unquote see something is that your brain's knitting together a bunch of tiny pictures uh, and then filling in the blanks. And that's what we call vision. I, I, how, I, how, do I re, how do I represent that with a picture? Mm -hmm. um, I, I can represent the scene correctly. I can get the brightness correctly. And I can say, here's the scene as could have been viewed by a driver. But can we do better than that? Can we give them a panoramic view of uh, generated from the kind of 3D technology that you use and you train and develop? Can we give them that 3D panoramic? And then they look at it. It potentially that's a much better display as the, I think that is the potential to be a, 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 an even truer display than the best that we can produce today. Yeah. Has anyone talked to you or do you know of anyone that's, you know, the, a, artificial intelligence is the big buzzword nowadays. And I'm just wondering about if anyone has even started talking about some areas where artificial intelligence may help. And I, I mean, you know, may help in research or maybe help inside of, uh keeping drivers aware and keeping drivers attentive um you know so that they don't get into a serious mishap um, so that's not something that's not something i've read about yet but uh I, I think whether we like it or not uh artificial intelligence is going to be interwoven into just about everything we do that's an electromechanical system so I'd be surprised if, yeah, I'll probably say 10 to 15 years and it'll happen in five. But if in a few years in the future, if it's, if that stuff's not becoming integral to uh, the human warnings and human feedback that we get uh, from mm -hmm. these smart vehicles. Um, I've got a qu another question here from Stanley. I'm going to bring it up because I wanted to ask you about training and sort of what kinds of things, I mean, you do training in human factors for you know, agencies or, or people that want to learn. Um, but I'm wondering also like what's what's out there. And uh, St Stanley's uh, question here is considering geographic or financial limitations, what would you regard as the most informative and expansive resource for further education information around human factors and crash cases? Um, well, I think so. So from a continuing ed standpoint, uh, Mutart offers a lot of his stuff uh, online. I think it's pre-recorded webinars. Um, I obviously think a lot of Jeff, uh, his, I think his research is fantastic and uh, had a good relationship with him since I met uh, you know, him back in 2005, I think. Um, so you know, his stuff is really good. Uh, there are a few universities, uh, Idaho and Aberdeen both, and, and probably more, uh, that are teaching human factors uh, through uh, th you know, in a distance learning format. Uh, that can be that can be helpful if you want to go the formal route, um, and, and then I, I think that that as the demand increases, uh, forensic training group uh, out of Nashville, the folks I teach with now, uh, 
it wouldn't surprise me if if Tony Becker called me and said, we're putting together an online curriculum, would you do it? You know, Rick Ruth is doing it with CDR for Society of Automotive Engineers. IPTM is doing it. Um, so I, I think that, that that will, you know, fill that market niche. Uh, I mean, for, especially for someone uh, like Stanley on another continent, that's a, I complain about sending employees out of town for a week. And it's like, really, you got to go to Chicago for a week, that class, how much, you know, that's a whole nother level of, of uh, expense for, you know, for, uh, for folks uh, outside, you know, outside the U.S. and other places like that. Now, do, uh, do you offer training though? Like you do human factors training as well? Uh, so forensic training group um, out of Nashville, Tony Becker, yeah. Scott okay. Skinner, James Loftus, those guys, uh, uh, about once a year, I teach for them. I'll be teaching Oklahoma State Police uh, two short classes uh, this June. Okay. So tell me about what you are currently working on or like what are the next steps for you in this particular area, like research studies or ideas you have for the future? So I think, I think the two things, uh, one of the most interesting things that is about to happen is the research that that Swarup and Jeff were working on and Jeff Sue at Rex getting an idea of how bright retroreflective tape is to to actually alert a driver at what point that's that's information we have not had we've we've had those few of us who could even measure the brightness of the tape were sort of like okay it it meets the ANSI spec for design or it doesn't meet the ANSI spec for design but what does that mean from a human performance standpoint, Jeff Swarup and Jeff Sue are trying to uh, get that answered. Uh, that's going to be really interesting. And, you know, as with anything, the first study that gets done is just going to be building blocks for other studies. So that field is, I think, really important. Um, and I think the further adaptation and refinement of things like uh, Adrian's small object detection model. Uh, which is going to be built into the response software. Uh, if that can be built upon, uh, I think that's going to give us uh, some good information in nighttime cases where we don't have uh, a one-to-one -one test study where, where we got glare sources and uh, uh, other ambiguous, you know, where age may really be a factor one way or the other. Uh, what, is, so that's, sorry, what is the small detection model? So small object detection model is a visibility model that was developed in the see, early 90s is the first version of it that comes out by a German researcher, Wilhelm Adrian. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty mathematically intense, really it's a lighting model. Uh, and, and there are some issues that make it a difficult one-to-one -one comparison with a crash reconstruction. Uh, the simplicity and size of the object. That, I mean, it's the small object detection model. It wasn't the side of a tractor trailer or an adult pedestrian standing up. So there are certainly areas where it's not an apples to apples comparison, but there's a tremendous amount of really good information in there about how the brightness of glare, the number of glare sources, the angle of those sources, the age of the, of the viewer, all change our ability to uh, to, to you know, see an object under low light conditions. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's there's a lot of great stuff in it, but it needs for crash reconstruction. It needs some further fleshing out, um, and it it can be it can be improved. Yeah, for sure. Hey, Will, um, we're, we're just getting on a little bit, but could I share your uh, your LinkedIn profile just in case people wanted to get a hold of you or something like that? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, let me bring it up here. So that's, uh, let me see if I make this larger. There we go. That'll be bigger. So yeah, if anyone's interested, uh, you can find uh, Will up on LinkedIn and also on his website here. So uh, it, this is uh, the best place to get a hold of you just through the website. Yeah, I, I will. I have to confess to being probably the worst LinkedIn user in the world. Uh, I, every time I log in, I find messages that I need to apologize for not responding to. Uh, but email, I am I am pretty good uh, about about uh, responding to so yeah um, if I can if I can help out that's the best way to get in touch with me 
Excellent. Well, I enjoyed your presentation, uh, you know, at, at Rex. And uh, are you, are you going to be at any other conferences in your future? Just curious if anyone wants to try and catch you at, at some other conference. Uh, what do you got lined up next? Uh, so next one is the Texas uh, Association of Accident Reconstruction Specialists in October. And I, I believe it is in San Antonio this year. I know it's not in Austin because of the conflict with the Formula One race. They finally got tired of fighting for hotel space. So I, I believe San Antonio, uh, but it's it's uh, I'll be on the TARS uh, website. That'll be the next one, and that's I think a full three day. Um, and that you know, the TARS membership is uh, really an an advanced group of very well trained people in general. I mean, they've had Dr. Mutart, they've had Jeff Suey. Uh, so I'm going to try to give. The TARS one will be a little bit more on the advanced side where the human factors proper class that I teach, uh, like what I'll be doing for Oklahoma State Police. As a former police officer, I know you don't come in with tons and tons of, of, of background all the time. I'm trying to start from the ground up. And with that one, ideally, they're ready to get into Mutart's advanced class and really like really dive in from the start understanding things and not be blown away so that's that's an introduction to get you through your work as a police officer and and a good foundation to go on this one for tars uh i'm really going to try to give give those folks uh you know the best i got so it'll be a little more advanced okay jeffrey martin here is asking if you're going to be at hfes in october um i would i would love to be um uh work work and family may get may get in the way of that especially with tars um that's the heart of my son's crazy competitive travel across the country soccer season um and i I mean he can drive himself there now but i i kind of hate to to ditch him but if i can yeah hfps is one i would really really like to be at that's as he finishes high school that's one i'll be at every year Okay. Well, well, look, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, a ton of information, great presentation. I really like the content and the way you sort of delivered it. It was really, really great to follow along and, and what you had going. So yeah, th thank you so much for being here. Gene, thank you very much for having me on. It's been a lot of fun and I uh, can't wait to talk to you more about the Recon 3D stuff. Awesome. All right. Hey, hang back a second. I'll be back in a bit. All right. Okay, everyone, that's it. That's uh, episode 84. And uh, we're going to be back again in probably a week or two, uh, maybe in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be traveling next week. But uh, looking forward to everyone. Uh, Recon 3D class, June 6th, and the Cloud Compare, the 27th and 28th of June. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Really appreciate your time. And I wish you all a very happy Thursday. Take care. Bye-bye.